Welcome back to Kernbrook, Beth Kettleman. Beth graduated from Kernbrook um, Ceramics in 1995. She graduated from Stanford University in 1981 with her BA in English. She also earned her MBA in Arts Management from UCLA in 1986. Beth had taught at Greenwich House Pottery, New York University, and Pratt Institute. She has shown work across the world, including in Providence, Rhode Island, Seoul, uh, South Korea, France, London, New York, San Francisco, uh, Switzerland, and many, many more. Too many to stand up here and talk. Mm -hmm. she's, <laughs> she's represented in many public and private collections, including the Risty Museum, the Archie Bray Foundation, and Dior Flagships London, Hong Kong. Beth's work is easily res uh, recognizable through the porcelain cast found um, objects and their installation into ornate concentration and displays. Beth has worked in the upcoming show at Wasserman Projects for their winter to, uh, 2022 exhibition titled Cast Illusions, which opens tomorrow. Please welcome back to Cranbrook, Beth Kettleman. Thank you so much. And um, it's so wonderful to be here. And um, in your fancy new studios, I'm completely jealous. And um, thank you, Ian, for inviting me. So um, I'm going to show you some older work that I don't usually show because I want you to see the path that I took after Cranbrook. And um, I want you to know that there were a lot of detours along the way and that um, it took me a while to find my stride. So you'll see. So here I am in my studio in Brooklyn with all of my molds. I have hundreds and hundreds of molds. So I love to look at things that evoke a sense of wonder. And this is the, um, the porcelain room in the palace at Aranjuez, Spain. And I think it's just, it's just an overwhelming sensory overload experience. And everything you see is porcelain. It's just wall-to-wall -wall porcelain figurines. It's um, just teeming with excess. And um, anyway, I, I just, I, I find it exhilarating and horrifying and wonderful all at once. So uh, <clears throat> this is my thesis show from Cranbrook. And just to give you a sense of scale, it's about, these panels are about six and a half feet tall. And uh, they are covered in these kind of crusty looking glazes that make it seem like these fragments were dug up somewhere. But then when you get in close, you see that they're made of just ordinary, very banal objects like gardening shears and soft serve ice cream cones that are cast. And so you have this disjointed sense of time of you know, the expectation that it's something old and then these contemporary, very ordinary objects. So I built them at my studio at Cranbrook on these standard doors, just slabs on these standard doors and just groaning with you know, cast everything I could think of and um, literally tore the slabs apart and brought them down the stairs, thank you very much, to the kiln room. <laughs> and, um, so after Cranbrook, I did as, as many residencies as I could because I just wanted to hit the ground running. I, had, I was just full of steam and so I went to Kohler, that was one of the most exciting places because they gave me an enormous studio on the factory floor and access to so many uh, resources of the factory and they don't encourage people to work with their product line but I really wanted to so I made this suite uh, ba of bathroom fixtures that uh, are somewhere between Marie Antoinette and um, I don't know the Flintstones I guess and I cast the the hardware uh, in their brass factory in the brass area of the factories so I worked both in the metals and in the pottery area of the factory. It was an amazing place. So then I moved back to New York, and this was my first show at a gallery called Thomas Healy Gallery, and they did a show called Bathroom, amazingly enough. And I was very excited to be in great company there. You can see kind of on the right is 
one of Andy Warhol's piss paintings, and then, whoops, above is John Waters' photograph uh, called Seven Assholes, amazingly enough. And then um, at the very big, oh, at the entrance to the gallery was a beautiful Alice Neal painting. And uh, when I got out of Cranbrook, I don't know how it is now, but when I was there, commercial glazes and gold luster and all of those things were absolutely frowned upon. And when I got out, all I wanted to do was just pour it on, you know, just go to the max. And I think I was in a bit of a rebellious spirit. And I made this, this piece, which is called Ricky and Lucy's Twin Headboards. And it's mixed media uh, with upholstery, pink upholstery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think I was just sort of pushing the boundaries of kitsch. And um, this was another show at, in the windows of Barney's New York, which is a f fancy retailer that no longer exists. But they used to be known for their windows, and they used to invite artists to do things in their windows. It was a lot of fun to be in a non-art venue and a, a place where just anybody walking by could see so I had the bathroom fixtures in there. That was, they were, very, I was like, are you gonna sit a model on the toilet? And they were like, oh no, no, we can't, we can't do that. We can put a toilet on our window, but we're not gonna sit a model on that. So <clears throat> then I, uh, this was my first show. I started working with Sybaris Gallery right when I graduated from Cranbrook and they offered me a show, solo show two years down the line. So this was that show. And I was still in that mode of just trying to like, push the kitsch elements as, and pop elements in my work as far as I could. So I did this series of self-portraits in these just elaborate frames. These, this is about five feet tall, and it's many panels that are sort of overlapping and look like one panel, but it's actually many panels. So I was just about to get married, and so I have this Barbie figurine sort of floating off on a Valium cloud above, and these cherubs with the pills and everything. I was, I was very nervous about this life change. And, um, and speaking of detours and life changes, um, at a certain point I had twins. This, is, this piece is really strange to look at for me because this is before I had my kids, but I have red-headed boy-girl twins. And uh, when I look at these cherubs, I'm like, that's very eerie to think about. And um, this piece is called Blue Plate Special. And I took about, well, I took quite a few years off when I had my kids. There was really no way to get into the studio. I just was, I really had my hands full. But interestingly enough, the hiatus was so productive for me. And when I got back into the studio, I had a completely different attitude and so much clarity about what I wanted to do. And I was quite merciless. I looked at my work and I, I just saw that the color was not working for me. And I felt like I didn't have any more to add to the dialogue on pop and kitsch that ha kind of was circulating in the art world. And I just said, okay, the color is, I'm dispensing with color entirely. Let's just toss the whole thing on the ground and see what happens. So I started looking at this children's wallpaper and I was quite captivated by it because I loved the sort of surreal sense of the islands of, or these landscapes that just floated on the wall and then kind of dissipated into thin air. And I was trying to imagine what it would be like if they were in three dimensions. And that was the idea I started working with. And at that point, the gallery, Sybaris Gallery had closed. I was absolutely starting over. I had to kind of make my way in every way, but I just was very determined to kind of express these new ideas. So I pitched the director of Greenwich House Pottery on this idea because I they had a beautiful little intimate gallery upstairs and I just knew that my work would look great there. So they they bought it for some reason and just said, okay, we'll give you a show here, get, you know, here in a year, we'll give you a show. And so I was off and running 
and I started making these sort of islands, these kind of dreamscapes that would float off of the wall. I wanted this sense of floating and kind of an immersive environment. So these are some of the things I was doing along the way. And this is the final installation. It's called Folly. It's about 20 feet by maybe eight and a half feet tall. And when I saw it in the gallery, I really felt like for the first time, I had found my stride. This is really what I was meant to be making. And mind you, this took 15 years out of Cranbrook for me to feel that way. So just to put it in perspective for you, but uh, everything just absolutely took off from there. Uh, New York Times, which had never covered anything at Greenwich House before, did three quarters of a page and three pictures. And I got a new gallery. And they said, we're taking your work to London and Paris and Basel. And, and then they did that and Seoul, Korea, and everything. Um, so this piece is a pattern. But as you move across the wall, it's almost like it's almost cinematic. Everything changes, almost like a stop motion animation. So uh, in this piece, you can see the bridesmaids kind of go further and further down into the pond until, um, yeah, you can sort of see it close up. And then all, until the kind of all the way on the right side, you can see that all that's left is a, a little bubble in the pond. And I like the idea of this piece being very polite when you look at it at first, and then when you get in close, it being a little bit dark, and people kind of have to look for it and find their own narrative. So this piece was an addition, and um, one addition uh, was acquired by the Christian Dior Boutique, the, uh, the flagship in London, and one was acquired by the Dior Boutique in Hong Kong. And I just thought they did such a beautiful job with this installation. Like they literally scaled the room to the installation and it looks just magnificent there. Um, so this piece is one of the ones at the Wasserman Projects and I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Also based on historic wallpaper, this is based on a print room that's in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And um, this is the first time I introduced color back into my work. It's actually colored clay, not uh, an applied color. But um, <clears throat> the little vignettes are, I mean, I always use cast found objects in my work. And I collect a lot of things from the 1950s because I think I really respond to that sense of optimism of things from the 50s. And this little sailor boy is actually a dog toy. And I just love him because he looks so hapless. And he's always, um, you know, he plays different characters in my work in different things. And so here he is discovering this deadly but very alluring uh, bikini girl. I think of her as sort of a siren leading him to his doom. And this, this doll, you know, when you cast things in white porcelain, they, things that would ordinarily be quite cheerful become a little sinister. And I, when I found her, she didn't have any arms, so I decided to apply these branch arms on her. Uh, this is another piece that's in the Wasserman Projects. And I did a series of mirrors on literary themes. I, I was an English major in my undergraduate um, education, and that has come out in the themes of my work in ways that I wasn't exactly expecting, but it's been really um, exciting for me to see. And I feel like the mirrors are kind of furthering that idea of an immersive experience for the viewer, something that lures you in to a, an alternate universe in a way. So this piece is called Fire and Ice, and it's based on a poem by Robert Pr Frost of the same name, and I, I th it's an apocalyptic poem. So I think of this piece as kind of cheerfully apocalyptic. So we have this, this doll whose head is exploding into a mushroom cloud, and a little figure on, on the balcony above looking on, 
And then on the other side, you see this parade of little flower girls ending in this swan boat, which is careening off the edge of the waterfall. So the pieces are all, the mirrors are all porcelain, and they're all multiple pieces, but they are, you know, sort of pieced together and in overlapping, so it looks very seamless. So the, um, a couple of years ago, actually 2018, the RISD Museum uh, invited me to create a, an installation in the period rooms of the museum. And I was very excited about this option because it, I had been wanting to really do an entire room, and this was my opportunity. So uh, the project just kept growing. I just took a deep dive, and um, it led to not just the period room, which was a two-year project, and took, and you know, my assistants and I made about 10,000 pieces for this period room. And then we, I decided that what I really wanted was, if I was gonna make a fake period room, I wanted um, some fake tour guides to take you around. So I collaborated with the staff at the museum, the video um, department, and we created this mockumentary where these tour guides, these amateur historians, would take you around the Games of Chance room. So this was my first film, and we literally, the museum hired actors, we workshopped this with the actors over the course of six months, and then um, you know, made a 20 minute short film. So then the question became, the film was gonna be on the RISD website uh, as a permanent edition. So then the question became, well, how are we going to access this film? And so I, again, collaborated with the design department at the museum and c to make a fake website. Um, so I, we made this web page, which would be the, what I imagined the two amateur historians would make, like a vintage 1990s, really hokey, super amateurish web page. And if you scroll down this web page, then you see um, not just the film, but kind of a virtual 360 of the room and it's still up there. So I'm gonna show you just a two minute um, quick little um, behind the scenes tour. Let's see, now how do I do this? Oh, here we go. Oh, it doesn't do that. Every room tells a story. And I created this room to tell the story of a very peculiar man. The RISD Museum invited me to create an installation in Pendleton House, the wing that houses the decorative arts collection of Charles Pendleton. Pendleton himself was a bit of a mystery. Even his obituary said he was a man who lived strangely apart from his fellow men. And then it turns out that the two things that were known about him were that he got expelled from Yale for an indiscretion with a young lady and that he was an inveterate gambler. So I thought, well, that's enough for me to go on. I decided to invent a period room to tell the story of Pendleton's fall from grace. Since I'm an artist and not a historian, I felt free to embellish. The theme of the Games of Chance Room is luck. And to show Pendleton's changing fortunes, there's a shipwreck on one side of the room and paradise on the other. I always start with my collection of toys and figurines. When I cast them in porcelain, they transform into different characters in my stories. For games of chance, I chose this Marilyn Monroe doll to play Lady Luck, and then I added a blindfold. I found this Colonel Sanders doll from KFC, and I thought he would be the perfect Charles Pendleton. The project also includes a short film called The Pleasures of Ownership. Two self-proclaimed experts lead a tour of the Games of Chance room, dropping hints about Pendleton's scandals along the way. In the end, it's up to the viewer to decide what's fact and what's fiction. So here's Charles Pendleton, and no one knows what he did uh, 
which involved a young woman. We, we don't know what that indiscretion was that got him kicked out of Yale his freshman year, but suffice it to say that for somebody in the late 1800s, a white wealthy man to get kicked out of Yale his freshman year, it must have been something really, really egregious. So the RISD Museum, you know, in exchange for his really prized collection of decorative art, they essentially um, lent credibility to somebody with an image problem. So my hope was that when people look at my project there and they see that it's a fiction, they might start to look at other things within the museum and question the narratives that are presented and um, try and um, see for themselves what's fact and what's fiction. So this is a project that's at the um, that's right that's up right now at the Bernardo Foundation in Limoges, France, and um, it's called uh, Mastering Paradise. And the idea it's about 16 feet wide, I guess, and eight well maybe not quite eight feet tall. Anyway, um, the idea is that. Um, commercialism uh, has corrupted this pristine view of nature and the garden. So when you look at this close, again, it's very polite from afar, and then when you, there are some rude and some somewhat um, impolite moments when you get in close. So I love this little sailor boy kind of looking up the skirt of this figurine, and I also love the strange kind of shifts in scale that happen when you work with found objects. So this is another museum intervention that I did that just came down actually. It was at the Cheekwood Museum in Nashville and this is the morning room there which is this little jewel box of a room that I just love. And next door is the dining room and I was very excited about the dining room because I'd always wanted to do a kind of a riff on the 18th century dessert table. So I kind of piled this dining table high with everything I could think of to throw at it. And um, yeah, it was, nice, it was nice to kind of have that opportunity to work in a different way. So here we go, sort of coming full circle. And you can see sort of the transformation of the work over time. But I think the through lines really are kind of the interest in the found object, the transformation of that object into um, another realm, sort of the using of the decorative arts as a, as a foil in a way for these ideas of lost innocence and corruption that play out in the work. And um, I think also the interest in the high and low, the sort of kitsch, um, pop items from every day and this history of royal porcelain uh, in, your, in um, Europe. So anyway, I'm looking forward to talking to some of you afterwards and you know, I'm happy to answer any questions.